Chapter One of the Doings of Raffles Haw. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patrick Wells. The Doings of Raffles Haw by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Chapter One: A Double Enigma. I'm afraid that he won't come," said Laura McIntyre in a disconsolate voice. "Why not?" Oh, look at the weather. It is something too awful. As she spoke, a whirl of snow beat with a muffled patter against the cosy red curtained window, while a long blast of wind shrieked and whistled through the branches of the great white limbed elms which skirted the garden. Robert McIntyre rose from the sketch upon which he had been working, and, taking one of the lamps in his hand, peered out into the darkness. The long skeleton limbs of the bare trees tossed and quivered dimly amid the whirling drift. His sister sat by the fire, her fancy work in her lap, and looked up at her brother's profile, which showed against a brilliant yellow light. It was a handsome face, young and fair and clear cut, with wavy brown hair combed backwards and rippling down into that outward curve at the ends which one associates with the artistic temperament. There was refinement, too, in his slightly puckered eyes, his daintily gold-rimmed pince-nez glasses, in the black velveteen cloak which caught the light so richly upon his shoulders. In his mouth only there was something, a suspicion of coarseness, a possibility of weakness, which in the eyes of some, and of his sister among them, marred the grace and beauty of his features. Yet, as he was wont himself to say, when one thinks that each poor mortal is heir to a legacy of every trait or bodily taint of so vast a line of ancestors, lucky indeed is the man who does not find that nature has scored up some long owing family debt upon his features. And indeed, in this case the remorseless creditor had gone so far as to exact a claim from the lady also, though in her case the extreme beauty of the upper part of her face drew the eye away from any weakness which might be found in the lower. She was darker than her brother, so dark that her heavily coiled hair seemed to be black until the light shone slantwise across it. The delicate, half-petulant features, the finely traced brows, and the thoughtful, humorous eyes were all perfect in their way, and yet the combination left something to be desired. There was a vague sense of a flaw somewhere, in a feature or an expression, which resolved itself, when analyzed, into a slight outturning and droop of the lower lip, small indeed, and yet pronounced enough to turn what would have been a beautiful face into merely a pretty one. Very despondent and somewhat cross she looked as she leaned back in the armchair, the tangle of bright-colored silks and of drab holland upon her lap, her hands clasped behind her head, with her snowy forearms and little pink elbows projecting on either side. "'I know he won't come,' she repeated. "'Nonsense, Laura. Of course he'll come. A sailor, and afraid of the weather. Ha!' She raised her finger, and a smile of triumph played over her face, only to die away again into a blank look of disappointment. "'It is only Papa,' she murmured. A shuffling step was heard in the hall, and a little peaky man, with his slippers very much down at the heels, came shambling into the room. Mr. McIntyre was pale and furtive-looking, with a thin, straggling red beard shot with grey, and a sunken, downcast face. Ill-fortune and ill-health had both left their marks upon him. Ten years before he had been one of the largest and richest gun-makers in Birmingham. But a long run of commercial bad luck had sapped his great fortune, and had finally driven him into the bankruptcy court. The death of his wife on the very day of his insolvency had filled his cup of sorrow, and he had gone about since with a stunned, half-dazed expression upon his weak, pallid face, which spoke of a mind unhinged. So complete had been his downfall that the family would have been reduced to absolute poverty were it not for a small legacy of two hundred a year which both the children had received from one of their uncles upon their mother's side, who had amassed a fortune in Australia. By combining their incomes, and by taking a house in the quiet country district of Tamfield, some fourteen miles from the great midland city, they were still able to live with some approach to comfort. The change, however, was a bitter one to all, to Robert, 
who had to forego the luxuries dear to his artistic temperament, and to think of turning what had been merely an overruling hobby into a means of earning a living, and even more to Laura, who winced before the pity of her old friends, and found the lanes and field of Tanfield intolerably dull after the life and bustle of Edbiston. Their comfort was aggravated by the conduct of their father, whose life now was one long wail over his misfortunes, and who alternatively sought comfort in the prayer-book and in the decanter for the ills which had befallen him. To Laura, however, Tamfield presented one attraction, which was now about to be taken from her. Their choice of the little country hamlet as their residence had been determined by the fact of their old friend, the Reverend John Spurling, having been nominated as the vicar, Hector Spurling, the elder son, two months Laura senior, had been engaged to her for some years, and was indeed upon the point of marrying her, when the sudden financial crash had disarranged their plans. A sub-lieutenant in the navy, he was home on leave at present, and hardly an evening passed without his making his way from the vicarage to Elmdene, where the McIntyres resided. Today, however, a note had reached them to the effect that he had been suddenly ordered on duty, and that he must rejoin his ship at Portsmouth by the next evening. He would look in, were it but for half an hour, to bid them adieu. "'Where's Hector?' asked Mr. McIntyre, blinking round from side to side. "'He's not come, father. How could you expect him to come on such a night as this? Why, there must be two feet of snow in the gleb field.' "'Not come, eh?' croaked the old man, throwing himself down upon the sofa. "'Well, well, it only wants him and his father to throw us over, and the thing will be complete.' "'How can you even hint it at such a thing, father?' cried Laura indignantly. "'They have been as true as steel. What would they think if they heard you?' "'I think, Robert,' he said, disregarding his daughter's protest, "'that I will have a drop, just the very smallest possible drop, of brandy. A mere thimbleful will do. But I rather think that I have caught cold during the snowstorm today.' Robert went on sketching stolidly in his folding book, but Laura looked up from her work. "'I am afraid there is nothing in the house, father,' she said. "'Laura, Laura!' He shook his head as one more in sorrow than in anger. "'You are no longer a girl, Laura. You are a woman. The manager of a household, Laura. We trust you. We look entirely towards you. And yet you leave your poor brother, Robert, without any brandy? To say nothing of me, your father. Good heavens, Laura, what would your mother have said? Think of accidents. Think of sudden illness. Think of apologetic fits.' "'Laura, it is a very grave res a very grave response, a very great risk that you run.' "'I hardly touch the stuff,' said Robert curtly. "'Laura need not provide any for me.' "'As a medicine it is invaluable, Robert, to be used, you understand, and not to be abused. "'That's the whole secret of it. "'But I'll step down to the three pigeons for half an hour.' "'My dear father,' cried the young man, "'you surely are not going out upon such a night.' If you must have Branley, could I not send Sarah for some? Please let me send Sarah, or I would go myself, or— Pip! came a little paper pellet from his sister's chair on to the sketchbook in front of him. He enrolled it and held it to the light. For heaven's sake, let him go, was scrawled across it. Well, in any case, wrap yourself up warm, he continued, laying bare his sudden change of front with a masculine clumsiness which horrified his sister. Perhaps it is not as cold as it looks. You can't lose your way, that is one blessing, and it is not more than a hundred yards. With many mumbles and grumbles at his daughter's want of foresight, old McIntyre struggled into his great coat and wrapped his scarf round his long, thin throat. A sharp gust of cold wind made the lamps flicker as he threw open the hall door. His two children listened to the dull fall of his footsteps as he slowly picked out the winding garden path. "'He gets worse. He becomes intolerable,' said Robert at last. "'We should not have let him out. He may make a public exhibition of himself.' "'But it's Hector's last night,' pleaded Laura. "'It would be dreadful if they met and he noticed anything. That was why I wished him to go.' "'Then you were only just in time,' remarked her brother, "'for I hear the gate go, and yes, you see?' As he spoke, a cheery hail came from outside. With a sharp rat-tat at the windows, Robert stepped out and threw open the door to admit a tall young man, whose black frieze jacket was all mottled and glistened with snow-crystals. 
laughing loudly as he shook himself like a newfoundland dog he kicked the snow from his boots before entering the lamp-lit room hector spurling's profession was written in every line of his face the clean-shaven lip and chin the little fringe of side whisker the straight decisive mouth and the hard weathered tanned cheeks all spoke of the royal navy fifty such faces may be seen any night of the year round the mess table of the royal naval college in portsmouth dockyard faces which bear a closer resemblance to each other than brother does commonly to brother they are all cast in a common mould the products of a system which teaches early self-reliance hardihood and manliness a fine type upon the whole less refined and less intellectual perhaps than their brothers of the land but full of truth and energy and heroism in figure he was straight tall and well knit with keen green eyes and the sharp prompt manner of a man who has been accustomed both to command and to obey you had my note he said as he entered the room i have to go again laura isn't it a bore old smithers is short-handed and wants me back at once he sat down by the girl and put his brown hand across her white one it won't be a very large order this time he continued it's the flying squadron business madeira gibraltar lisbon and home i shouldn't wonder if we were back in march it seems only the other day that you landed she answered poor little girl but it won't be long mind you take good care of her robert when i am gone and when i come again laura it will be the very last time mind hang the money there are plenty who manage on less we need not have a house why should we we can get very nice rooms at the south sea at two pounds a week mcdougall our paymaster has just married and he only gives thirty shillings you would not be afraid laura no indeed the dear old government is so awfully cautious wait 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 that's always his cry i tell him that he ought to have been in the government heavy ordnance department but i'll speak to him to-night i'll talk him round see if i don't and you must speak to your own governor robert here will back you up and here are the ports and the dates that we are due at each mind that you have a letter waiting for me at every one he took a slip of paper from the side pocket of his coat but instead of handing it to the lady he remained staring at it with the utmost astonishment upon his face well i never he exclaimed look here robert what do you call this hold it to the light why it's a fifty-pound bank of england note nothing remarkable about it that i can see on the contrary it's the queerest thing that ever happened to me i can't make heads or tails of it come then hector cried miss mcintyre with a challenge in her eyes something very queer happened to me also to-day i'll bet a pair of gloves that my adventure was more out of the common than yours though i have nothing so nice to show at the end of it come i'll take that and robert here shall be the judge state your cases the young artist shut up his sketch-book and rested his head upon his hand with a face of mock solemnity ladies first go along laura though i think i know something of your adventure already it was this morning hector she said oh by the way the story will make you go wild i had forgotten that however you mustn't mind because really the poor fellow was perfectly mad what on earth was it asked the young officer his eyes travelling from the bank-note to his fiancée oh it was harmless enough and yet you will confess that it was very queer i had gone out for a walk but as the snow began to fall i took shelter under the shed which the workmen had built at the near end of the great new house the men had gone you know and the owner is supposed to be coming to-morrow but the shed is still standing i was sitting there upon a packing-case when a man came down the road and stopped under the same shelter he was a quiet pale-faced man very tall and thin not much more than thirty i should think poorly dressed but with the look and bearing of a gentleman he asked me one or two questions about the village and the people which of course i answered until at last we found ourselves chatting away in the pleasantest and easiest fashion of all sorts of things the time passed so quickly that i forgot all about the snow until he drew my attention to it having stopped for the moment then just as i was turning to go what in the world do you suppose that he did he took a step towards me looked in a sad pensive way into my face and said i wonder whether you would care for me if i were without a penny wasn't that strange i felt so frightened that i whisked out the shed and was off down the road before he could add another word but really hector you need not look so black for when i look back at it i can quite see from his tone and manner that he meant no harm he was thinking aloud without the least intention of being offensive i am convinced that the poor fellow was mad hum there is some method in his madness it seems to me remarked her brother 
there would be some method in my kicking said the lieutenant savagely i've never heard a more outrageous thing in my life now i said that you would be wild she laid her white hand upon the sleeve of his rough frayed jacket it was nothing i shall never see the poor fellow again he was evidently a stranger to this part of the country but that was my little adventure now let us have yours the young man crackled the banknote between his fingers and thumb while he passed his other hand over his hair with the action of a man who strives to collect himself it is some ridiculous mistake he said i must try and set it straight yet i don't know how to set about it either i was going down to the village from the vicarage just after dusk when i found a fellow in a trap who had gotten himself into broken water one wheel had sunk into the edge of the ditch which had been hidden by the snow and the whole thing was high and dry with a list of starboard enough to slide him out of his seat i lent a hand of course and soon had the wheel in the road again it was quite dark and i fancy that the fellow thought that i was a bumpkin for we did not exchange five words as he drove off he shoved this into my hand it was the merest chance that i did not chuck it away for feeling that it was a crumpled piece of paper i imagined that it might be a tradesman's advertisement or something of the kind however as luck would have it i put it in my pocket and there i found it when i looked for the dates of our cruise now you know as much of the matter as i do brother and sister stared at the black and white crinkled note with astonishment upon their faces why your unknown traveller must have been monte cristo or rothschild at the least said robert i am bound to say laura that i think you have lost your bet oh i am quite content to lose it i never heard of such a piece of luck what a perfectly delightful man this must be to know but i can't take his money said hector spurling looking somewhat ruefully at the note a little prize money is all very well in its way but a johnny must draw the line somewhere besides it must have been a mistake and yet he meant to give me something big for he could not mistake a note for a coin i suppose i must advertise for the fellow it seems a pity too remarked robert i must say that i don't quite see it in the same light that you do indeed i think that you are very quixotic hector said laura mcintyre why should you not accept it in the spirit in which it was meant you did the stranger a service perhaps a greater service than you know of and he meant this as a little memento of the occasion i do not see that there is any possible reason against you keeping it oh come said the sailor with an embarrassed laugh it is not quite the thing not the sort of story one would care to tell at mess in any case you are off to-morrow morning observed robert you have no time to make inquiries about the mysterious croesus you must really make the best of it well look here laura you put it in your work basket cried hector spurling you shall be my banker and if the rightful owner turns up then i can refer him to you if not i suppose we must look on it as some kind of salvage money though i am bound to say i don't feel entirely comfortable about it he rose to his feet and threw the note down into the brown basket of coloured wools which stood beside her now laura i must up anchor for i promised the governor to be back by nine i won't be long this time my dear and it shall be the last good-bye robert good luck good-bye hector bon voyage the young artist remained by the table while his sister followed her lover to the door in the dim light of the hall he could see their figures and overhear their words next time little girl next time be it hector and nothing can part us nothing in the whole world nothing robert discreetly closed the door a moment later a thud from without and the quick footsteps crunching on the snow told him that their visitor had departed end of chapter one